Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to uh, introduce Ralph Cohen, who's uh, visiting us from the West Coast, uh, to talk about flow or homotopy theory, old and new. Right, thank you. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here. Um, so as the title suggests, I'd like to talk about a bit of old mathematics and um, some, at least to me, surprising uh, new applications. So uh, the, the point here. So <clears throat> the work I, I want to talk about, um, at least in terms of background, was uh, done about 30 years ago. It was published in um, 95, a joint work with John Jones and Graham Siegel, uh, where we introduced the notion of floor homotopy theory. So you all know uh, about floor homology, but we were quite interested in understanding... Have heard of. Sorry? Have heard of. Have heard of. No. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, and, uh, well, you know, I, I just recently I looked at the archive of old videos from the Einstein chair lectures, and I saw a video of Andreas Flohr uh, from probably the early 90s giving a talk about um, some of his... Uh, early uh, work on, on this. So you all remember that talk, so I, I'll go on from there. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah, it was a long time ago. Anyway, we were interested in the homotopy theoretic foundations of uh, floor homology, and I'll describe more about our motivation as I go on. Uh, but one question we asked almost right away is when is the floor homology, which is just defined in terms of a chain complex, which is in turn defined in terms of geometric uh, information, when is that the chain complex of a space? When, when is the floor homology the homology of a naturally occurring space? Early on we knew we needed a little bit uh, more general idea than space. We needed to be able to suspend and desuspend spaces, so we had to work with spectra of it. Just think of it in terms of spaces. And, you know, you didn't want just any space. We wanted a space uh, that was built out of uh, the geometric data that comes from the moduli spaces that are inherent in floor theory. So we wanted to figure out how to do that, and if one could do it. Um, so we, in, in this paper, uh, we gave a, a proposal for how to describe such a homotopy type such a space that realizes floor homology when certain conditions, and they turn out to be pretty restrictive conditions, are met. And we, we described some simple examples, and we were kind of excited by this. We really enjoyed working on this. And then it kind of fell flat. Um, it, it, we were expecting, hey, this is going to share, uh, give some real insight into floor theory. And, um, and it had no applications whatsoever. And, you know, these things happen in mathematics. You prove something you really like, and then eh, it's not worth much. And um, so that's what we thought happened. But then many years later, um, 25 years later, um, it started to uh, have some applications that we didn't ever envision. So I'd like to tell you about the old story as well as the new story of the new applications. Okay. Um, so, just in, as a way of background, in three important papers, uh, published in 88 and 89, uh, Floor introduced what's now called Floor Homology. He introduced uh, more theoretic homological invariants of certain uh, geometric situations uh, uh, that occur in uh, study of three manifolds, three and four manifolds, as well as symplectic geometry and topology. Uh, he, uh, just to uh, review a couple of the early examples, he introduced the notion of instanton homology. This is when gauge theory was hot and heavy, it still is. Um, uh, he introduced this notion uh, that had, has a property that when you pair it with Donaldson polynomial invariance of four manifolds, you get a topological quantum field theory, a gauge theoretic topological field theory. And between this from the structure and resulting structures that have followed cyber weight theory and so forth, it really transformed 
um, the study of smooth four manifold theory, uh, including four manifolds with boundary. Um, <clears throat> he also uh, used some of these ideas to study symplectic geometry, and this might have uh, shown the most important applications. Uh, he introduced again a Morse theoretic homological invariant of symplectic manifolds. It's known as symplectic or sometimes Hamiltonian floor homology uh, that allowed him to prove a well-known conjecture of Arnold about the number of fixed points of um, a diffeomorphism of a symplectic manifold that comes about from a Hamiltonian flow. And I'll say more about this later. And I think this was actually the subject of uh, Floor's talk here um, way back when. He also, in the same period of time, uh, in a different paper, he introduced the notion of Lagrangian intersection floor theory. As most of you know, when you have a symplectic manifold, it's an even, man even dimensional manifold with this symplectic form. Some of the most important submanifolds are uh, what are called Lagrangian submanifolds. They're half dimensional manifolds that, upon which the symplectic form identically vanishes. And he introduced a more theoretic approach to study the appropriate kind of intersection theory of these submanifolds. So that's called the Lagrangian intersection floor theory. And since that time, there have been several other um, versions and flavors of floor theory introduced, um, most notably by Osvath and Zabo and a Hagar floor homology, which has been quite useful in three manifold theory. Um, but in general, the rough idea in all of these or maybe not all, but in most of these theories, is to um, describe a Morse-like chain complex uh, generated by critical points. Boundary homomorphisms are determined by uh, flow lines between the critical points. And uh, a Morse-like chain complex uh, coming from a functional that's on typically an infinite dimensional manifold, infinite dimensional space. So, um, a lot of the techniques that we have from classical Morse theory don't necessarily work. So, the, really, some new ideas. Um, in order to kind of describe this and describe the problem about realizing uh, this floor homology by a space, uh, as a homology of a space, so like finding an underlying floor homotopy type, um, let, let's just go back to classical Morse theory. Um, and that's where one usually starts in thinking about these things. So as you all know, in classical Morse theory, you have a Morse function on a compact, closed uh, Riemannian manifold. You get a Morse chain complex. Uh, it's generated by the critical points. CP is generated by the critical points of index P. So you have a Riemannian manifold, which means you have a metric. And uh, when that uh, when you have a generic choice of metric, which is the, the genericity condition is a transversality condition um, called the morse smell condition, uh, wh when you have a generic metric, you can describe uh, the boundary homomorphism geometrically as well. Um, namely, uh, if you have a generator of the, crit of the chains and of dimension P, which is to say a critical point of index P, its boundary will be a linear combination of critical points of index P minus one. And the coefficient of that boundary is um, you look at the moduli space of gradient flow lines that connect A to B in this generic setting. These moduli spaces will be uh, manifolds. And in this case, it'll be uh, because of the indices involved, these will be zero dimensional uh, oriented manifolds. You can give them orientation. And so you can count the number of points with sign, and that's how you can describe um, the chain complex geometrically. Now, um, didn't you do something when the critical points had bigger degree and then you get the modulus spaces? Yeah, so that, Is that going to be used? That's what I'll talk about in a Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, that, that was by you before. Uh, we, we, that's right. We studied Morse theory on compact manifolds, including the higher dimensional moduli spaces, before we applied it to floor theory. That's right. 
Oh, um, they were also joint in that earlier work? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, but that doesn't involve suspending. That's not no, it does space. No, when you just space. have a compact manifold, you don't have to suspend or desuspend. Um, you can't do that here. No, and I'll I'll try to show you why. Where, where the you know where you this, can't do it, or you just didn't weren't able to do it. Well, um, to if you really wanted to avoid suspending and desuspending. Um, you need to work a whole lot harder than what we were able to do okay. because um, the attaching maps in a CW complex are a lot easier to describe um, when you suspend them. It's Pontryag and Tom theory. Oh. And, you know, Pontryag and Tom. I'm giving away the punchline. But no, no, I mean, it might be possible. I mean, there can be, be more to do. You don't maybe have to go to the spectrum level. I mean, that's all. That's all I'm, I'm just, it's like an open question you're saying. Right. I think one does in a lot of cases in floor theory where you have infinite dimensional things. Um, but there may well be cases where you don't have to go to. Because there is this technical work, I've forgotten his name, but it's not been understood. He does infinite dimensional Morse theory geometrically. And uh, so it's like, it might be the technical tool that's required. I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah, quite possibly. I talked about it with somebody here, but I forgot. I don't forgot his name. Think he left Okay. Okay. Yeah, quite possible. Anyway, um, so you can d describe this all geometrically, but you know, um, my background and um, Jones and Siegel, even to some extent, our background is algebraic topology, and um, in algebraic topology, uh, one would be less inclined to do that, you would look at the, a CW complex that naturally occurs um, from the data of a Morse function. Oh, that's what you're saying. Yeah. So when you have a Morse function compact manifold, you can get a CW complex, you have one cell uh, in dimension lambda for every critical point of index lambda. Um, back in the 1970s, uh, John Frink's studied the attaching maps in the cell complex. And, and actually, what, the way we thought of our project was a, a con, as a continuation of what Franks did. Um, so, but it naturally la uh, led to the question, well, can you do the same thing in floor theory? Is there a naturally occurring CW complex that realizes the floor complex? And by naturally occurring, I mean um, a, a space that, um, arises from the geometric data of a floor functional, namely uh, the uh, critical points and the uh, gradient flow lines between them. What does this complex represent in the finite dimensional The loop space or something? No, it's the manifold itself. It represents the manifold itself. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the, yeah, it led us to these questions. Does the floor complex arise as the CW uh, chains, the cellular chains of a, of a CW complex, or a CW spectrum, if you like? And, uh, and you know, when does that happen? So what, what properties of the data of a floor functional, these moduli spaces that occur in floor theory, what data do you need uh, about them, what geometric data, in order to construct a CW complex that realizes the floor chain complex. And of course, you want that CW complex to be the homotopy type of it to be an invariant of the geometry going on. OK. And then it led us actually to a, a, a just simply an algebraic topology question, um, an old style algebraic topology question, uh, namely 1950s style algebraic topology question that says, um, Given a finite chain complex, is there a reasonable way of classifying all CW complexes or CW spectra that realizes this chain complex? And by realizing, I mean you have a CW complex and so you have a corresponding uh, cellular chain complex. You want which, uh, how, how do you classify CW complexes whose corresponding cellular chain complex is the Morse complex or finite complex that you're given, you know, that um, they're, they're 
CW uh, chain complex is that complex. So how many different homotopy types can realize that chain complex? There are too many complexes in that sentence. Yeah, I know, it's a complex <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Anyway, so let's do the algebraic topology first. Warm up in the morning after a banquet. You know, let's just have some fun. You know, I, I can't think of anything more fun than doing some uh, classical homotopy theory. Um, <laughs> I'd like to convince you of that. Um, so suppose you're given a finite chain complex, <clears throat> like you are in Morse theory. Um, and uh, eventually you want to do this with infinite complexes and so forth. But suppose you just have a finite complex and each, each of the chain groups are finitely generated. And you may even have, um, like you do in Morse theory, a basis. Um, in Morse theory, the basis is given by the critical points of that um, index. And you want to um, classify, oops, sorry. You want to classify spaces, CW complexes, whose cellular chain complex is this. Okay, that's the goal. So you want to work backwards. What information do you have when you have a, a CW complex um, that goes beyond this chain complex? So suppose, you, know, you can actually have any filtered space, but you know, think of a, a, a cell complex filtered by the skeleton. And you can look at the quotients, I'll call them Ki, the subquotients. And of course, in the skeletal filtration, the Ki is a wedge of spheres. And its homology is this i chain group. So right away, um, you have a CW complex. The subquotients are determined by the chain complex that you want to realize. So the question we're addressing is kind of like, you know, how do you classify groups with a given uh, composition series? You, you know something about filtration and the, and the, and the subquotients. You know, a little bit more than that, so I want to identify it. Um, so I'm going to describe how this is kind of uh, thought of a long time ago in the uh, days of classical homotopy theory uh, in the 50s. So one of the tricks of the trade is you can take your quotient, ki, xi mod to xi minus 1, and replace it by a mapping cone. Um, Oops. Uh oh, sorry. Oh, I'm going backwards. I'm having trouble with this clicker. Okay, you replace it by this mapping cone. So instead of quotienting xi minus 1 to a point, you take a cone on it. It's so a homotopy equivalent space. And uh, why do that? Then the quotient map, which was xi to ki, becomes um, an inclusion map. Little trick, and then you can take the quotient of that inclusion map, and you get a suspension of the previous space. So um, by doing this trick, you, when you start with this original um, co-fibration sequence, this inclusion and passing through the quotient, you can extend that at least up to homotopy by going from xi to ki and then its quotient will be the suspension of xi minus 1. You can keep going. That's known as the Barrett Koopa extension. Um, one thing to remember in doing this is that in the original construction where ki is the quotient, um, the inclusion of xi uh, to xi minus 1 to xi to ki, that xi minus 1 is mapped to a point. In this setting, xi minus 1 is not mapped to a point, but there's a cone on xi minus 1, which means there's a canonical null homotopy of that inclusion of xi minus 1 to a point. You just go up to the um, cone point. So you're replacing points by cones. And, and that's somehow the whole idea here. Um, OK. So this is something that we all teach our beginning algebraic topology students, a first year graduate course, when you're learning about cellular homology. You can describe a composition where you take a Ki, uh, map it to that suspension of xi minus 1 that I just described, and then 
map that xi minus 1 to a ki minus 1, its quotient. So you have a map from ki to ki minus 1, suspended. And in um, uh, homology, one knows that that map is a map from ci to ci minus 1. That's the boundary homomorphism. That's how you realize that. So the chain complex not only determines these subquotients, but it also determines these maps. But wh what else do you have? Well, um, notice if I worked in the level of spaces rather than chain complexes, I could compose uh, all of these deltas. So I have a map from Kn to suspension of Kn minus 1, as I did just described, you could therefore compose it with, I guess it would be the twofold suspension of kn minus 2 and continuing on. And I think of this as a homotopy chain, uh, chain complex. Now what do I mean by that? Well, in a chain complex, composition of two maps is zero. These are maps of spaces, so there's no, there isn't a sense in which a composition of two maps is zero, but um, the composition of two of these maps is canonically null homotopic because when you look at how they were defined, there are these cone coordinates and you just whoosh, up to the cone coordinate becomes null homotopic. So up to canonical null homotopy, uh, composition of any two of these maps is um, trivial. Think of it that way, whatever trivial means. Well, one trick that you could do, or one bit of extra information you can do, is use that null homotopy to construct a new map. So, um, I wrote these suspension coordinates in order to be, to tell the truth, but ignore them. For, um, you have a map from kj to kj minus 1, that boundary map. But uh, this canonical null homotopy allows you to extend that map to a map on the cone of the previous kj, kj plus 1, by using the canonical null homotopy on that cone coordinate. You put that null homotopy on the cone coordinate, and that extends this map. Again, an old trick, I don't know who, who probably J.H.C. Whitehead, way back when. And you can keep going. And you can use all of the canonical null homotopies that occurred in that chain complex. I won't go into it, but, um, and you get maps from various iterated cones of iterated suspensions to another kj minus one. By the way, what I am doing, and many of you are familiar with the notion of a massy product or a toe to bracket. I'm describing that kind of construction by brute force which is the way I like it. Um, but anyway, you look at somehow the restriction of all of these extensions using all of these null homotopies to any one of these pieces, and you get a map that I'll call phi pq from an iterated cone of an iterated suspension of kp to kq. For any p and q, you get these maps. And again, our uh, forefathers there weren't many foremothers in those days uh, in algebraic topology uh, taught us that these maps determine the homotopy type of the CW complex. These are the so-called higher attaching maps in the CW structure. So it goes beyond what you need to define the chain complex, um, but these determine the attaching maps uh, and the homotopy type, I wrote of X, but, uh, well, actually I said the right thing. It's the stable homotopy type of X. That's why, uh, Dennis, and from this perspective, you really are um, forced to suspend and stuff, and which is why we use spectrum. They don't determine the homotopy type, they do, but they do determine the stable homotopy type. The, this is the higher order attaching. So remember our problem. How do you go from the chain complex to um, spaces that realize that chain complex. So suppose um, God gave you a bunch of maps phi pq. How do you know that they fit together right to um, determine the attaching maps of a, of a space, of a CW complex? Stable space. 
of a stable space, uh, right? Or a but, but doesn't your construction give the axioms? Yes. So, so what is the answer? So, um, to organize the coherence properties that you needed between all of these attaching maps in order to define the stable homotopy type, in other words, working backwards. Um, what we did was we described it functorially. We defined um, a category, J, and it'll seem a little weird at first, but uh, I hope to convince you that it isn't as weird as it looks. Um, so J, the objects are non-negative integers, and the morphisms between I and J is you take um, a vector of non-negative real numbers, length I minus J minus 1, you look at that whole space and you compactify it, one-point compactification. So how do you compose morphisms? Well, you can think of that morphism space as the space of sequences of non-negative real numbers, most of which are zero. The only ones that may not be zero are the ones uh, the, it, that have coordinates strictly between I and J. And when you think of it that way, um, composition in, the, in this category is just adding sequences. So it's not that big a deal. So why do that? Well, um, what we prove is uh, the theorem, one of the theorems in this old paper is that the realizations of finite chain complexes of uh, free abelian groups correspond to functors from this category. I'd like to say the category of spaces, but it's really a category of finite spectra. Um, that on the objects, um, th what this functor has, does on objects is determined by the chain complex. It sends a non-negative integer n to a wedge of spheres um, indexed by the basis of the nth chain group. Um, I notice I kind of just put a, um, a, a number l there without specifying what it was, and that's because we're sort of allowing to suspend and desuspend. So the dimension of that sphere is less important. And what does the word correspond to? I mean, in, as a mass statement. What's the statement? Yeah, I mean, it's a categorical statement that I prefer not to <laughs> make in, in its full detail, but um, there is a, an isomorphism of categories so that um, functors this way correspond to, um, to uh, spaces that realize this chain complex. There's actually another condition that I couldn't fit in this box, and you'll see that condition in a moment. Well, but, I mean, they seem to have different cardinalities. Homotopy types is like countable. And so the, it's, it's size, sort of a category of CW spectra, so you have a homotopy theory of CW spectra, and the two homotopy categories are isomorphic. Is the way but the it. domain is uncountable, so there could be lots of functors. Yeah, so we have to say about that, because the way I describe it in, the, in this statement is I am not, um, as, as I said a moment ago, I'm not specifying dimensions, so that, uh, in some sense putting an equivalence relationship. On that. But anyway, um, why, you know, where does this come from? It seems out of the blue. Um, and the re where it comes from is if you do have a functor from this category to spectra, it means that for every uh, morphism from M to N, you get a map between Z of M, which is a wedge of spheres, to Z of N. Or said equivalently, for uh, any product of the morphisms M to N and Z of N, you get a, um, a map to spheres. It turns out to be a smash product that has to do with this compactification that I was mentioned. But the point is, when you take this product of this morphism space with a sphere, which is what Z of M is made out of, you get an iterated cone of a sphere. You take non, uh, you know, uh, vectors of non-negative real numbers, compactify that and smash it with a sphere, you get an iterated cone of a sphere. And I'll say more about that. So it's just a way of thinking about these maps from iterated cones of sphere to spheres, and th these will be the attaching maps 
of the spectrum or the space that we're defining. Um, so, and the functoriality property that we described is a way of just saying, well, what do you need about these collection of maps in order that they do form attaching maps of a space? Okay. Uh, here's one observation. When n is m minus 1, uh, there's no cone coordinate, so it's just a map between spheres. And uh, that, the homotopy type of that map is determined by the chain complex. So this bit of data is actually given to you. What it does on morphisms from uh, m minus 1 to m, or m to m minus 1, uh, that's given to you. But all of the uh, behavior on higher dimensional morphisms is what you can choose when you want to find out all the ways of realizing a chain complex. That it corresponds again to the higher order attaching maps in the CW complex. All right, so this was fun for us um, it, it, from the point of view of algebraic topology, traditional homotopy theory. But how are you going to use this in floor theory? How, you know, in floor theory, you, in geometry, you're not given VPQs, maps of cones on disks, uh, cones on spheres to spheres. You're given geometry. You're given moduli spaces that have geometric meaning. Um, so how do you go from this geometry, uh, from this homotopy theory to the geometry? Well, there's an old, old tradition of doing that. And, um, and it's one of the parts of the answers to Dennis' question about why are we working with stable complex, complexes. In the old work of Pontryagin and Tom, uh, they describe geome uh, geometric topology in terms of cohortisms of manifolds in terms of stable homotopy. Um, so, in particular, we're just going to try to generalize um, the oldest of that work, which was due to Pontryagin way back in the 1930s. So, I'll just remind you of Pontryagin's theorem that says the homotopy groups of spheres the stable homotopy groups of spheres. So, oh, I'm sorry. So you look at uh, pi n plus k of s k, and you let k get large. That this stable homotopy groups of spheres correspond, bijective correspondence, uh, with framed cohortism classes of framed n-dimensional closed manifolds. So what's a framing? It just one way to think about it is if your manifold is embedded in some high-dimensional Euclidean space, a framing is a trivialization of that normal bundle, or equivalently, it's um, an extension of that embedding to an, um, uh, an embedding of the manifold across the disk of dimension equal to the co-dimension of the embedding in such a way that that's actually a diffeomorphism onto its image. So that's what a frame manifold is, and you take cohortism class in a suitable sense, so that's what um, Pontryagin proved. And it was the beginning, I think, of stable homotopy theory, Pontryagin's theorem that, hey, suspending is something you need to do sometimes. Um, another way of viewing it that's more relevant to the question we're addressing um, is that we're trying to classify CW complexes, CW spectra. Um, Pontryagin's theorem, in some sense, classifies what I call two cell complexes. Look at uh, cell complexes that are just simply built out of taking a sphere and attaching a disk. And do these in high dimensions so we don't have to worry about um, the suspending and all of that stuff in stable homotopy theory. And in an appropriate sense that is not made precise by this language, um, Pontryagin's theorem can say that uh, two cell complexes of this form, by the way, it really takes three cells to make this, because the sphere, you need a point as well as a cell, a disk. But I think for whatever reason, I think of it as a two cell complex. Um, these are classified by framed n dimensional closed manifolds, cohortism and classes. So here we go, from the homotopy theory here to the more geometric topology here, framed manifolds, closed manifolds. 
classical uh, work 90 some odd years ago. Well, how do you do this kind of classification for more complicated CW complexes? And that's what we're asking about. What kind of geometric information do you need to classify complexes with more cells? And um, one needs the notion of frame manifolds, not just closed frame manifolds, but manifolds of boundary, manifolds of corners in general. And basically, our idea was to do the analog of Pontryagin-Tom theory for frame manifolds of corners. So, um, how does that work? Well, very basic elementary differential topology, except now, remember, in the homotopy theory side, we saw that we were forced to look at maps from iterating cones of spheres to spheres. Now, a way to think of an iterated cone of a sphere is the following. Um, if you take a vector of non-negative real numbers, dimension equal to the number of cone coordinates, and you take a vector of any real numbers, uh, dimension equal to the sphere, and you take that whole space and compactify it, you get up to homeomorphism, uh, diffeomorphism, if in an appropriate sense, you get this iterated cone of a sphere. And of course, you can map it to this sphere, which is a one point compactification Euclidean space. So you can ask that this map be smooth, at least smooth away from infinity where you may have singularities. Um, and you do what you do in elementary differential topology. You pull back a regular point. And in Contriagin's classical theory, when you pull back a regular point, you get a manifold embedded in this Euclidean space. But now, notice our Euclidean space is what I would call a Euclidean space with corners. Because when you take R plus, of course, you have a boundary point. You take two copies of R plus, you have a boundary edge, and you have an edge in vertices. You take lots of copies of R plus, you have uh, vertices and edges and faces of various dimensions. So, so I, I refer, you can refer to it as a Euclidean space with corners. And you get a manifold that is embedded in this Euclidean space with corners. Um, its intersection with the corners here determine corners on your manifold. Um, it has the right dimension, namely the co-dimensions are right. And it's framed in the sense that um, if you pull back not just a regular point, but a small disk around that regular point, you get um, a trivialization of the tubular neighborhood or the, or the normal bundle. So it's a framed manifold with corners framed in this way. I actually just realized a moment ago that this number is wrong. It should be whatever the co-dimension is here. Um, that dimension, that Euclidean space. But you get a framed embedding of manifolds and corners, the corner structures determined and um, preserved. Okay, so we want to express these phi ij's in terms of frame manifolds and corners. So then you can ask the question, okay, suppose you're given by floor or whomever a collection of frame manifolds and corners. And that's a lot more promising. Because in floor theory, you're given moduli spaces. And in many of these cases, moduli, these moduli spaces are manifolds of corners. They may have singularities. They're singular manifolds of corners. Um, and in some cases, they're framed. So at least um, we're getting there. Um, suppose you're given a collection of frame manifolds of corners, like you are in floor theory. How can you build a homotopy type? We answered that question when you're given the phi ij's. How do we answer this question when you're given frame manifolds of corners? Um, so this is a question I just asked. And um, so we described um, an answer to that question in the following way. Just like we did in the homotopy theory, it was a kind of a functorial answer. This will be, in some sense, a functorial answer as well. We defined what one could call a frame flow category what we call the frame flow category. And this is just a topological category whose objects are a discrete set, and the morphisms are frame manifolds of corners. That's the way you think of it. The whole condition is that the morphisms need to be a manifold of corners. 
course, there's other conditions too that I won't dwell on, but you know, the compositions of morphisms have to preserve the corner structure, you know, we want it to map it to the boundary, and a couple other conditions like that. But the way to think of it is just simply have a category where the uh, morphisms are manifolds with corners, frame manifolds with corners. You can imagine talking about a complex uh, flow category where the, or an almost complex flow category where just the um, uh, morphism spaces are almost complex manifolds with corners as well. How, how are the manifolds of corners related to the discrete sets again? So, um, <clears throat> they form the morphisms between the objects, the discrete set are the object. Let me give you an example, the archetypical example, uh, which is something that uh, the three of us had studied a little bit earlier, um, that actually Dennis was asking about a little earlier, is um, the flow category of a classical Morse function satisfies these properties. Namely, um, the, what are, what's this flow category? The objects of this category are the critical points, and the morphisms uh, between critical points are the uh, flow lines. Really, you have to take piecewise flow lines that connect the critical points. You compose morphisms by just putting um, <coughs> Uh, these piecewise flow lines together. That's why you, you form piecewise flow lines. And it's uh, true that uh, the, those spaces of flow lines are framed manifolds with corners. We tried to find that in the literature, and we couldn't. We, we knew it was true, and everybody we talked to, experts, I maybe mean, hey, even asked Dennis, everybody said, sure, it's true, you have these are manifolds with corners. Couldn't find it in literature. Even asked Smale about it. He said, oh yeah, it's in my paper um, from the early 60s. Couldn't quite find it there, although I'm sure it's embedded in a non-trivial way there. Um, what was the question? That the um, spaces of piecewise flow lines uh, are manifolds with corners in Morse theory. Anyway, it is true, proved uh, by Katrin Verheim, uh, Taubes had a proof, um, Michael Hutchings had a proof, so, uh, it, but, you know, uh, a proof written down in the literature is relatively recent, although it's what one really, uh, it's a good example of what one calls a folk theorem that goes back at least to Smale's work in the early 60s. Now, remember, uh, when we just talked about classical Morse theory, we needed a, um, a generic condition on the metric that we call the, uh, that's called the Morse smell property, that's a transversality property. We need a property for this category as well, um, and that, um, so again, think of the category flow lines, because this is entirely motivated by this, in a, in a Morse function. In a category of flow lines, the critical points in a Morse function have a partial ordering, by, really by the index, when you have a generic metric. Um, one way of saying that uh, is you say one object is bigger than an other if there is a morphism between them, if there's a flow line between them. So in Morse theory, this would say if you can flow from A to B, you can't flow backwards from B to A. This is part of that um, a generic property that Morse smell metrics give you. It also says there are no loops of flow lines. Uh, so there's no way of flowing from a critical point to itself other than trivially. So we just say that the morphism space just consists of the identity element. And of course there's a notion of index, which is a little bit harder to um, describe in floor theory because things tend to be infinite dimensional. But one way of saying what you need is that there's a map, that's just a set map from the objects of your category to the integers that preserves the partial ordering and that describes the dimensions of the morphism spaces of the, think again, modulized spaces of piecewise flow lines. It describes the dimensions of those spaces by this rather uh, simple formula. It's the difference of these uh, values minus one. That's what happens in classical Morse theory. Um, so you, you have a notion of relative index. Anyway, we think of such a, uh, a map as an index map. Um, okay, and what we proved is that if you have a frame flow, minus one there. I mean, 
Uh, because you're, you're dividing out, you're just looking oh, at the line. space of oh, flow yeah. lines, you're dividing out by the action of the real yeah. numbers. Right. Anyway, um, so what we proved in this old paper, it was that if you have a frame flow category that satisfies this more smell condition, then, um, oh wait a minute, I'm on the wrong page. Here we are. If you have such a thing, then it determines one of these functors in homotopy theory that I described before, and therefore it defines for you a CW complex or CW spectrum that realizes the chain complex. What is the chain complex in this setting? It's just uh, generated by the object, again, think critical points, and um, the boundary homomorphisms are computed by counting the number of zero-dimensional morphisms um, that um, connect A to B. So again, the chain complex uses zero-dimensional moduli spaces, zero-dimensional morphism spaces, but this frame flow category is a way to get um, keep track of the higher dimensional morphism spaces. So if the moduli spaces you're given in floor theory satisfies this property, you get a frame flow category, then you can define a homotopy type, a floor homotopy type, defined from these moduli spaces in this way. And, um, and you have a floor homotopy theory, which may well give you deeper information than just floor homology. So, in, in the, uh, as you said er earlier, when you have just regular Morse theory, the, the cell complex you get realizes the manifold. Yeah. So, in so this what is this? Yeah. So I'll, ta I'll tell you some examples. So, um, sorry. Yeah, so, I mean, there's, you might think that because in the floor theory, things are infinite dimensional, you don't, you can, there really is a suspension going on and it really had to do a whole work in the spectrum, right? Whereas the manifold somehow, you get an actual space. Yeah, it's somehow the oh, Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, sorry. That's one, that's one indication, but then, does some of this floor homology have a ring structure? Is sometimes, a, sometimes. Uh, and you'll yeah. see. But then, but then it wouldn't be stable if there's a ring structure. Oh, well, it depends what the ring structure is. You won't have a cup product in, in that sense, but you may have a chas Sullivan product. And that's what does happen. But that's not stable all the time. Yeah, it is. No, it's not. Yeah. I bet you a nickel. <laughs> that's what, that's what the, um, you know, what we did to describe the Chas Sullivan theory in terms of a ring structure on a spectrum, L of M to the minus T M and all of that. That's a, that, that's a ring spectrum. So you see the Chas Sullivan product oh, on the a spectrum. Spectrum. A ring spectrum. Yeah. So you, oh. a ring, it's a spectrum that has a product on it. Uh, yeah. So might there be ring spectrum here? Sometimes. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll give you examples. So let me talk about examples. That's what I want to do with the rest of my time. And um, um, as I expected, I would be way behind schedule. Um, all right, let me just move on a little bit and talk about examples. So the first example back in our original paper was of a Morse function. This frame flow category of uh, critical points and flow lines between them. So sort of that allows you to build a homotopy type using this machinery. And of course, all you get is the manifold itself. Not very exciting, but at least we got the right answer. Um, about 15 years later, uh, when um, I was thinking a lot about string topology, I was thinking in particular about uh, what is the relationship between string topology of a manifold and um, the symplectic topology of the cotangent bundle of the manifold. So, um, so of course, as, as you know, the cotangent bundle, P star of M of a manifold, has a canonical symplectic form. Um, you think of P star of M as, a, even if M is compact, a, a two N dimensional non compact manifold. And suppose you're given a Hamiltonian. Well, in uh, a time dependent periodic Hamiltonian, that's sort of the data you need in the floor theory. So in this, all that means, topologically, is that you're given a map from your symplectic manifold, in this case, T star M, cross a circle to R, a smooth map. 
And uh, you also know that any symplectic manifold has a contractible family of, uh, of almost complex structures. So it has a unique up to homotopy almost complex structure. So choose an almost complex structure J. And then what I proved is that for a generic choice of H and J, there is a frame flow category that I call CHJ that and therefore a space or spectrum that realizes the symplectic floor homology of T star of X. Um, the objects are of this category are periodic orbits of the Hamiltonian vector field. So what does that mean? A periodic orbit, by periodic it means that it's a map from a circle. It's a loop in T star of M. You start to see the connection with string topology. You have a loop in T star of M has to satisfy a differential equation coming from the Hamiltonian vector field. We won't worry about that too much. And the morphism between loops should be a map of a cylinder that connects these loops. And it satisfies a differential equation. What differential equation? Well, you're given, uh, as part of your data, an almost complex structure. And you're also given a Hamiltonian. What you, the differential equation you get is a perturbed form of the cauchy riemann equations based on this almost complex structure. So it's known as a J-holomorphic cylinder. So the morphisms in this category are geometric. They're morphisms of J-holomorphic cylinders that connect between, um, that connect uh, periodic orbits of the Hamiltonian. And I showed that when you plug this in, you, that it, with respect to generic choices of the Hamiltonian and the complex structure, that you get this data that I was talking to, a frame flow category, and so you get a homotopy type. What is that homotopy type? The answer is, um, at least if M is spin, the answer is the suspension spectrum of the free loop space of the M. Um, if M is not spin, um, actually, in the paper I wrote, there was a mistake originally, and it was pointed out by Mohammed Abu Zaid um, that you needed this spin condition. Otherwise, um, you, instead of the free loop space, you have to take the Tom space of some orientation bubble. But it has the same homology, for example. Ralph, question? So, the turbo proved a similar result, right? Yes. So, so let, me, let no me say that. I was just about to say that. Um, so this generalizes the theorem of Viterbo, uh, who computed much earlier that, this ha that the floor homology is the homology of the free loop space. That's what sort of motivated me to understanding the floor homotopy type. And the floor homotopy type is you actually get the free loop space, the topology of it, at least the stable topology of the free loop space out of this data. Okay, so that, I mean, that was fun. Uh, I, and I should say, this has been pushed forward by uh, several people, inclu including Amo Gattel and Schwartz, who showed how you can realize the Charles Sullivan product from the point of view of uh, symplectic topology and so forth. But I want to spend the rest of my time, and I know time is running out real quickly, talking about recent examples. So, for 25 years, that, that example of the Charles Sullivan uh, theory was was the only example, um, but the last five, six, seven years there have been uh, several really exciting examples. And um, boy, I'm really running out of time, so I'm not sure how much to say about this. But one of the exciting examples is work of Lipschitz and Sarkar on Kovanov homotopy theory. When all when knows about Kovanov homology. Um, and what they attempted to do and did was um, they wanted to study the homotopy theoretic foundations of Kovanov's uh, invariance of knots and links. Um, and I'm going to run through some of this. But the goal of their work is to associate to a link diagram, which is the basic data used in defining Kovanov homology, um, a family of spaces or spectra um, whose homotopy types, entire homotopy types of these spaces are invariants of the knots and links, not just their homology. Um, so their K-theory, their cohortism theory, any kind of um, invariants of the space you want to take are invariants of the knots and links. 
And, um, and so that the Kovan of homology is, is the homology of these spaces in spectra. And that's what they were able to do. And what they did is they constructed a frame full category in the sense we just talked about. Looked for frame manifolds at corners. And they did this out of um, the uh, uh, data given in the Kovanov chain complex. Um, the generators and relations, I was going to go into this more, but I think I'm going to skip up over it. But anyway, they studied a frame flow category. They defined a homotopy theory associated to the Kovanov theory. And I should say, just this last fall, um, there was a program at MSRI in Berkeley that um, on floor homotopy theory. And one of the main uh, directions of that program was to apply it to knot and link theory using Kovanov theory and the work of Lipschitz and Sakar. And at, you know, I had the pleasure of participating in that program. Natalie was one of the organizers. Um, and I'm, from my perspective, it was really exciting to see all these young homotopy theorists interacting with young knot theorists and symplectic geometers and so forth, really talking to each other, breaking through the language barriers that one often has in discussing mathematics. It was really quite exciting. Um, let me just talk about a couple uh, examples of um, properties that have just been proven in the last year or two. Um, Lipschitz and Sarkar, oh yeah, let me just say, one of the reasons for having a homotopy type, in fact a stable homotopy type, is to give extra structure to the cohomology that you get from just the chain complex. As Dennis was saying, you don't get a cup product um, when you are forced to suspend and desuspend, but you do get um, an action of the Steenrod algebra. Um, algebraic topologists that were brought up on that and sort of run through our veins. And um, you get an action of the steam ride algebra when the uh, cohomology involved is the cohomology of a space or even a spectrum. And Lipschitz and Sakar showed that that action is non-trivial often. And in fact, the, one of the easiest um, steam rod operations, the square two, so-called square two operations, they show acts non-trivially for many knots, torus knots in particular. Um, and C, who I believe was a student of uh, Lipschitz, um, showed that, in fact, there are pairs of links that have isomorphic Kovanov homology, but not as modules over the Steenrad algebra. The isomorphism is just as abelian groups, but as modular Steenrad algebra, they're not isomorphic, and so it distinguishes those knots and links where the Kovanov homology does not. Um, and other applications, uh, one to a generalization of Rasmussen slice genus bound. Stofregen and John were, were two of the young people who participated in this program at MSRI, and they used, uh, are, used this Kovanov homo homotopy theory to get um, ranking qualities for Kovanov homology. Again, just, I, I think the applications are just starting to be mined now. Are there massive products too? Yeah. Um, in the case, in a symplectic case, I'm not sure about the uh, Kovanov setting. All right, and I was about to describe um, how we did this, but let me spend um, the overtime talking about the most interesting application. And I know there's always an overtime. Um, and that's one of the most exciting applications, one of the most exciting theorems, I think, in topology in recent years, and that's Monolesco's um, solution to the triangulation problem. It used an equivariant version of floor homotopy theory. Um, so the question he addressed, this classical question that Dennis has thought about in the um, early part of his career for sure, and that is, does every manifold, every topological manifold admit a triangulation? So this is a question about topological manifolds, not about smooth manifolds particularly. And by triangulation, it just means a homeomorphism to a simplicial complex. Um, and just to be careful, 
Um, there's a thing called a PL structure, which one can view as, sometimes this language is used as a combinatorial triangulation. And a combinatorial triangulation is one where the um, simplicial complex has a property that the link of, links of the simplices are spheres. So that's equivalent to a PL structure. So that's a related question, but a Knazer's original question is just any old triangulation, which to distinguish it, I'll just say a simplicial triangulation as opposed to a combinatorial triangulation. Um, so the first counterexample, in other words, the first discovery of, well, let, let me talk, before I just go to that example, let me just give you some highlights of the history here, because it's fascinating. Um, way back 100 years ago, Rado proved that every surface admits a combinatorial triangulation, and then Moise proved 30 years later or so that any three manifold admits a combinatorial triangulation, in other words, a PL structure. Again, it's not surprising from the modern viewpoint, but that's what happened then. And in the 30s, Cairns and Whitehead uh, showed that smooth manifolds of any dimension admit combinatorial triangulations. Smooth implies PL. So the beginning of the modern uh, theory, I think, goes is in the 1960s when Kirby and Zeebemann showed uh, that there exist topological manifolds that don't have PL structures, don't have these combinatorial triangulations, um, and they describe an obstruction class uh, to finding a PL structure called the Kirby Zeebemann class. It's a class. Uh, delta of m that lives in H4 of the manifold with Z2 coefficients. So if it's zero, you can find a PL structure, a combinatorial triangulation, otherwise you cannot. But the first counterexample to Knazer's original question is triangulation conjecture. Is there any simplicial triangulation? Wasn't done until Kasson did this in the, um, I believe it was the early 90s. Um, and he showed that uh, Friedman's four-dimensional E8 manifold, which Friedman had shown uh, did not have a PL structure, in fact, uh, doesn't have any kind of triangulation. And he did it using what's now called the Kasson invariant, which was later proven to be related to floor homology. So the germs of the idea that floor homology might be relevant to this question, I think, um, was planted by Kasson in the early 90s. But um, in dimensions five and greater, this question was unresolved until Monolesco's recent work, five years ago maybe, um, in which he used an equivariant cyber witten version of floor homotopy theory. Um, so, oh boy, can I have a couple minutes to uh, just, just outline the context of what he did? I started a little late, too. So. Okay. I should have it, so when, when do we go to dinner? <laughs> um, anyway, so let me just describe the setup, because I think it's just the setup is really cool. Um, so suppose you have, uh, let's take an oriented manifold for now, a closed manifold, dimensions five or bigger, uh, that has a triangulation. What do you get out of this? <clears throat> well, of course, we have the Kirby Zeeman then obstruction class, Obstruction having a PL structure, living in H4 of M with Z2 coefficient. There's another class that uh, Dennis uh, defined together with Cohen and Sato, different, same Sullivan, different Cohen, um, C of K, which is an element of uh, H4 of your manifold, like the Kirby Zeebenman class, except the coefficients are now in the Bordesen group of homology three spheres. So how do you define that? Well, uh, we're assuming it's oriented. So H4, upper four, cohomology, by Poincaré duality is H lower n minus four. And so class there can be described, since you have this homeomorphism to a simple, simplicial complex, as a linear combination of the simplices of co-dimension four. And what is the coefficient? You take the link of that simplex, and that uh, is it turns out to be a homology three sphere, and so determines an element in this Bordism class. 
Notice that if this were a combinatorial triangulation, a PL structure, the links would be spheres, and so you would have the actual three sphere, and this class would be zero. But in, in general, uh, they showed that this is a well-defined cohomology class. And how is it related to uh, what this question? Well, um, it's related via the Rockleen homomorphism. So um, the Rockleen homomorphism, in this sense, you, so you take uh, a homology three sphere has a unique spin structure. You bound it by a four manifold that has a spin structure. And you look at the signature of that four manifold, it's divisible out of I8, and you reduce mod two, roughly shows that that's well defined. It didn't depend on the choice of bounding manifold. And you get an element in Z2, which you showed is non-trivial, well defined. So you can look at this exact sequence, take the kernel. And what does any algebraic topologist do with an exact sequence, short exact sequence like this? You make a long exact sequence of cohomology. And um, so we're going to do, one does that where these are the coefficient groups. And so the Rockleen homomorphism, um, therefore, is a homomorphism from, gives you a homomorphism from H4 of M with coefficients here in this uh, boardism of homology three spheres to Z2. And what the proof um, is that it maps to the kirby Zeebenman class. Okay, what does that give you? Well, if this were a combinatorial triangulation, a PL structure, uh, the kirby Zeebenman class would be zero. But it may not be zero, but it is in the image of this Rockleen homomorphism, so it's in the kernel of this connecting homomorphism, the long exact sequence. An amazing result um, of Galuski and Stern, and also by Motu Matumoto, I think independently, is that that condition, that the kirby zeebenman class being the kernel of that connecting homomorphism, is necessary and sufficient. So a way to say that result is a closed topological manifold uh, of dimension bigger or equal to five admits a triangulation if and only if the kirby zeebenman class is uh, in the kernel of this connecting homomorphism. Really cool result. What year is that? Uh, eight, late 80s. Now, how, I mean, maybe the connecting homomorphism is always zero. It's just the zero homomorphism. If that were the case, it would say every topological manifold that mentioned bigger equal to five would be triangulable by this theorem. Turns out that's an if and only of statement two, um, again by Galuski and Stern and Matsumoto, and they show, um, what I describe it in terms of split. Look, so I'm sorry, let me go back. How could that, um, Boundary homomorphism be zero all the time. Well, one way it could be zero all the time is that if this exact sequence from the Rockleen homomorphism was a split short exact sequence, there was a splitting from Z mod 2 back to the homology 3 spheres. And again, these folks, Galuski and Stern and Matsumoto, showed that it's if and only if, that, in other words, they proved that. Um, there exist non-triangulable manifolds of every dimension five and larger, if and only if the sequence does not split. So it reduces this question, or at least part of this question, to studying that Rockleen homomorphism. And is there a splitting? Really cool result. And that's what Monolesco answered. He showed that that sequence does not split, and therefore, there must exist, by Galuski and Stern and Matsumoto, there must exist manifolds, topological manifolds that are not triangular in every dimension. And the way he does it, and this is where I'll end, is um, you suppose the converse is true? If there were a splitting, that would, uh, uh, the image of the non trivial class in Z2 would be a homology three sphere of order two in the sportism group uh, that 
um, has a non-zero Rockleyan invariant. And he observed that that could not happen if the Rockleyan invariant lifted to the integers, as opposed to just being Z mod 2 value. Um, the uh, homomorphism, issue about it being a homomorphism or not, but such a lifting is what Monolesco was able to construct using floor theory. And I think that's all I'll say, um, other than his equivariant version of floor theory, uh, homotopy theory, was constructed in a different way than what I described that what we did, but afterwards he was able to show that it's completely equivalent to the approach, and you could use the uh, approach of framed manifolds with corners as well. So I'll stop here. I guess at what the homotopy type of the um, Kovanov uh, homotopy theory um, is, and, and, you know, just directly in terms of the, the knot or link complement. Um, yes and no, I guess is the answer. <laughs> Namely, uh, you know, Lipschitz and Sakhar were very um, explicit, but it's very complicated. So, um, you know, it has, the Kovanov chain complex is a chain complex generated by all different configurations of resolution of all different crossings in a link diagram. So it's a really good chain complex. And what um, Lipschitz and Sakhar did is they, out of the, all that data, they constructed a space that turned out to be a frame manifold of corners, and in fact, a lot of frame manifolds of corners that fit together in the way that we described. Yeah. So, uh, I guess the real answer to your question is no, the, uh, uh, but every step of the way, the construction does just use the geometric data that you're given right there. But it's pretty complicated. But they're doing calculations, they're calculating the K-theory, and, um, and it's pretty interesting. Right, so uh, let's thank Ralph again.